welcome to the Everyone Active podcast. I am one of your hosts, Jo, and unfortunately, my co-host, Michelle, is poorly today. So I have luckily and lovely been joined by the wonderful Isaac. Thank you very much. Hello, Isaac. Welcome to the podcast. So, Isaac, let me know what you do, what site you work at, and kind of how you got into the fitness industry. Uh, hi, my name is Isaac. So, I'm a fitness motivator and personal trainer at Everyone Active Westminster Lodge in St Albans. Um, been a PT for now, like two years. Yeah. Um, so, I knew Isaac back when I was working at Westminster Lodge and used to come in dedicated training. Like, I've always associated you with training because I know that you have a very special skill and you've recently come back from South Africa. Yes. Why were you in South Africa? Uh, so I got the great opportunity to represent my country um, at Commonwealth Championships. Um, yeah, it was honestly like an incredible experience, a dream come true. In the Commonwealth Championships, let us know the sport. Uh, powerlifting. Yay! Okay, so powerlifting. So listeners, we've spoken before and few episodes ago, we had Rory on talking about strength. But powerlifting is its own sport because it's slightly different from traditional weight training that we might see in the gym. Can you just speak me through what the main differences and skills that are involved in powerlifting? So powerlifting comprises of three lifts. So you've got your squat, your bench and your deadlift. So three main compound movements. Okay, so squat legs, bench press, chest. Chest, yeah. And what was the third? Deadlift. It's fine. So um, across the three, you're getting your full body, full body in there. Um, and competitions they comprise, you get three lifts on each of the three lifts. So it's nine lifts in total. And when we're talking lifts, we're talking heavy. One rep maxes. Wow. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. So some very incredible heavyweights being lifted out there. Um, and yeah, the your best lift of the three gets added up to a total number. There's an age and weight categories. Um, and the person who lifts the most weight wins, takes the trophy home at the end of the day. This is amazing. Right, let's put this into context. So if I was going to do and do a barbell squat in the gym, I'm a 40-year-old female, mid-40s-year-old female, and I weigh about 63 kg, and I probably squat 60, 65 kg, and I'll do 10 reps maybe. Done. That's me. Let me know what you squat. Uh, so my best squat in competition is 252.5 kilos. Oh my goodness. And just to put that into context, how much do you weigh personally? Um, so I compete in the under 93 kilo weight class, but I weighed in at about 90 kilos. So I'm a little bit under my weight class. And you're lifting how much on your legs and back? Uh, 250 odd, yeah. 250 kilograms and one rep? Or? One rep, yeah. Whoa. And I'm guessing this is full squat range, not a little bend of the knees. This is right down low. Yeah. So uh, at a competition, you've got referees. Um, typically, there's three. And then you'll have a jury table uh, at national and international competitions that watch the video replays. Um, but there's also like rules. So for squat, your hip crease has to go below your knees. Yes. Yeah. Or oh, so for true for squat. For, for squat, yeah. Yes. Okay, bench press. So we might also know it as chest press mm -hmm. on a barbell rather than dumbbells. So barbell, again, I'd probably be doing 10 reps at about 25 to 30 kg. Hit me with yours. Uh, my best bench is 147.5. Oh my gosh. This is just a whole level. But this in itself explains why it's such a skilled sport. Because to be able to get that amount of strength through you. Yeah. Like, What's the training like for it? Um, weirdly, quite easy. Um, so Says the professional. <laughs> so um, there's, again, 101 different training methods and stuff that you can, you can follow. But with strength training, you're working with towards the typical lower end of your rep ranges. So towards like when you get to competition, you'll mainly do like triples, maybe like fours. Everyone's a little bit different, but you work underneath your max. So I would never like lift my one rep max in training. But the idea is, is if my one rep max for easy math is 100 kilos and I lift 95 kilos for three in training, I know that I've got more than five kilos in me or 
if I lift 95 kilos in training and it is super duper easy and I'm like, I could do that for five, six, then you know that you've got more on the platform. Yeah. Um, is that quite an exciting feeling? Like if you're getting your three reps and they are heavy and you're like, okay, the body is on fire at the moment. Everything's working correctly. It's, it's the best feeling. then. That's, that that's the smile on his face. <laughs> so anybody that's listening to this rather than watching this, Isaac is literally beaming from cheek to cheek. It's so lovely being able to talk to somebody so passionate about their sport. Um, that, that's what I fell in love with was the objectiveness of it in the sense that if you lift 200 kilos, you then lift 205. You know your training has made an improvement. Yeah. Um, and there's just no better feeling than beating your three rep max or your one rep max or just hitting that PB and again, just getting that satisfaction of all the hard work that you're putting in week in, week out. Uh, that was the one thing about South Africa was when I was out there, as soon as I walked out onto the platform, I just said to myself, it was all worth it. Yes. You know, you, you do question yourself sometimes of the hours that you're in the gym, the nutrition, you know, all the other stuff that you do outside and the work that you put in day in, day out. But then when you get to experience moments like that. It's like your stage. So we're doing quite a bit of work at the moment. And I know you're coming on the training course as well. But we're kind of thinking about how we can give more to our members. Like it's not just necessarily a workout in the gym. Kind of like the psychological side or the sleep side and the nutrition side. And you as a competitor just summarise beautifully. Like the amount of cortisol that's coming into your body and you're actually putting yourself under stress, but you're not de-stressing yourself. Yeah. It's an enjoyable stress. It's a performance stress. And it's that psychological edge that's made you go, yes, I've got this. We've got one last lift to talk about. Your deadlift. The deadlift, yes. I love a deadlift. Um, if I'm going heavy, I'm going to go 90, probably for about six reps. That is my heavy. Go on then. Uh so best lifting competition is 252 kilos again. God, 252 kilos deadlift. All the way straight. I'm guessing there's judges, shoulder posture, hip posture. Yeah, so a bit controversial. I pull sumo. Okay. Some people will say it's cheating. Just explain <laughs> what a sumo pull is. So uh, two typical forms of deadlift. You have your conventional form where your legs are typically about hip width apart and your hands will be outside of your legs. Sumo is then the opposite. So you'll take your feet slightly wider and your hands will be inside of your foot positioning. That is a lot of extra glute work going on as glute well. Factors, yeah. Everything, yeah. Wow. Congratulations, lovely. Thank you. So what's next steps after that? So you've represented England. Thank you for representing England. <laughs> then what happens? What's next? So uh, I'm going to take a bit of time off competing. Um, I'm currently in the junior age category and I'm next year I age out. So the junior stop at 23. I turn 23 next year. So next year is my last year. And I go up into the open age category. So I'm going up against people who are a lot bigger, a lot stronger, a lot more experienced. Yes. Than so I've already started my longer term plan. Um, so I'm actually going to cut down the weight category. Um, and again, with time being on my side, I don't have to be as drastic. I can do it more sustainably over a longer time. Um, but I've actually never had an off season. I've always trained for like a competition, yep. competed, gone straight into another one. And kind of I've spent my junior years and my junior career just competing, mm -hmm. uh, which is really great. I've got lots of competition experience, but I haven't given my body that chance to mature and recover, develop, recover, um, and make some of the progress that I need to. So, um, yeah, I'm just going to let my coach do his magic. And... You've just answered my next question. Do you have a coach? I do. Amazing. How did you find him, her? Uh, so his name's Christian. Uh, he is known as... Uh, very well respected athlete and coach in the sport of powerlifting um, and I went to him just because he was the best and he's also um, currently the best 93 kilo lifter in the country as well as one of the best in the world oh, so wow. he is someone so, I look up to 100% very a much educated fully qualified coached coach yeah <laughs> and I guess your personal training clients will now also 
get a little bit more insight from you as well because you are a fully qualified, fully registered, competing personal trainer. Yeah. Which, excellent. Which brings us on to, so I have pulled Isaac in today because each year we get given or the American College of Sports Medicine, which is really the of everything fitness releases fitness trends for 2025. And they have a couple of weeks ago, I think it came out, released their top 20 lift. So Isaac and I are just gonna chat through a few of them now, because there is indeed employing professionals on there, which is what you absolutely did and look where it got you, literally to represent your country, which is epic. And then we'll just, yeah, chat through. And as always, as Michelle and I always say, if you've got any questions about anything that we're talking about, Please feedback, write comments on where you're listening to this, where you're sharing this from or viewing this from. And Isaac and I can probably get together and try and answer them for you. Right. We're going to start right at the bottom of this list. Hot and cold therapies. Do you do either? I do. Do you do either? Oh, you do. I what do, do you do? Uh, so I typically go to the sauna or the steam room and, yeah. um, at least once a week. Nice. Yeah, that's really good. So what do you feel that gives you and what does that do to your body personally? So, don't quote me on this, mm -hmm. but <laughs> um, I just know that exposure in the sauna, steam room, hot therapy is meant to be really good for you yeah. uh, longer term. So, I appreciate I'm young <laughs> and I've tried to That's amazing. have as much longevity with my training and yeah. lifestyle and everything. It's so important and I love, because I've been in the industry a little bit longer than you, but I love the fact that. Uh, parts like this are now becoming prominent like it is so important we are still the same human physiology that we were thousands of years ago and we used to recover more we used to rest more we weren't exposed to so much blue light and you are absolutely correct spending time in a sauna kind of lets our body relax a bit more and starts it calming and starts it repairing so that's yeah absolutely have you ever done a cold plunge I have not a fan of them, I'll be honest. I'm the same. Like, I will do them. If I've been on a long run, I am the person that will do an ice bath and I will put my woolly hat on, put my music in, and I will sit there and just there. But that's because I know that I've got to get up and perform the next day. Like, I've got to come in for clients or I've got to teach in a class. So the idea behind the cold therapy is that it restores you to where you were so you could go again. So it's like that. It's not a quick fix, but that's how it's helping out our muscles. It's helping with the recovery of DOMS. So that is our hot and cold therapies. Okay, I love that this one has appeared on the list. Lifestyle medicine. So lifestyle medicine is now the recognition that uh, exercise can help be part of the program to manage chronic diseases. So at Westminster Lodge, I know that you've got Parkinson's classes. Yep. Um, are you seeing a trend in people using the gym? Do you think it's become more open? I definitely think so. I think it's that kind of preactive um, approach to it is the training, the having a balanced diet, the small things that you do on the day-to-day -day basis is almost preventing yeah. some of these longer-term uh, health diseases or just because you have been diagnosed with Parkinson's or something that, that doesn't stop you from exercising 100%. and it almost kickstarts you to kind of do, you know, do it all Absolutely. over again. And, and I guess we can both feel the benefits of just walking into the gym because it's like a bit of a community. So you've automatically got a, oh, yeah, this is making me feel good. And it's those hormones that we release into our body that actually help start managing a chronic pain, a chronic illness. And it's great to see that us as a general population are starting to recognise how important exercise is in terms of that. Number three, don't know if you do much this, or when I say number three, this is third up, so 17th, body weight training. Do you? Uh, not very well. So <laughs> <laughs> I can I can lift heavy circles well, but um, try and get me doing some pull-ups. I'll burn out very quickly. <laughs> like, what is this? Um yeah, no, I, I think it's very, very useful. Uh, obviously, calisthenics off the back of that is massive. It's something which you can do anywhere. So, yeah, and body weight training. And also, body weight training enables absolutely anybody to train. Like, anything. You do not need anything. You don't have to go to the extreme of calisthenics. You could literally get up from your sofa at home, 
sit back down, stand up, sit back down, stand up 10 times and you've just done 10 squats, which is move the blood around your body, move the muscles in your leg and kind of ticked a bit of a heart writer as an exercise. Okay, next one up the list. And this actually surprised me that this has dropped so far down the list is personal training. It's dropped. Any thoughts on why you think that's now not so high on the trending list? I think we'll, we'll, we'll cover them a little bit later, but with the gain in technology and different um, kind of things that we have access to now in the current world, um, it makes... It has made fitness a lot more accessible. Mm -hmm. So I think that you don't necessarily, when you walk into a gym, you might have a rough idea on how to use certain bits of equipment or you can find a video. You don't necessarily need someone to be like, this is how you use a machine, this is how you do a squat type thing. Um, it's I think, I think it, that's probably the main reason why it's... Although you and I will both flip that little thought a little bit. So if I've ever been competing in anything, be it a race, be it an endurance race, I've always, I'm qualified, but I've always gone to a personal trainer because I want somebody actually to be able to speak to there and then and be like, do you know what? If you just tweaked that a little bit, your rate is going to improve by a percentage each time. Um, and I think personal training doesn't just give you, yeah, absolutely. You can log on and you can see how we do a squat on there. But as I said, the techniques there, the encouragement to probably lift a tiny bit heavier than what you think. And there's just so much knowledge. Like, think how much you get from your coach. Like, you couldn't, you could listen to a video, but whether you walk into the place and actually do what that video says. So, uh, yeah. Sad to see that drop a little bit, but we're going to nudge. I think I think as well, like, with, with personal training is, it's not just to come in and go through a workout is... Even if you are someone who already trains, think you know that you know what you're doing type thing, is exactly. you can more take a personal trainer with a niche, myself, for example, obviously with powerlifting and strength training. If you're someone who has trained for 20, 30 years, whatever it is, could say that you can confidently squat, but coming to someone like myself is, okay, well, you've squatted the same weight for the last five years. And sort of why, why is that? What, what can you do? that might add that extra five kilos or 10 over the next 12, 18 months, but you might not necessarily have, have seen. And it's kind of that you lean into the trainer's niche and knowledge of yes. kind of the finer details and stuff of any training method or. Totally, know. totally. And I just found this really interesting that they were put in there as two separate things because just above personal training is employing professionals. So I guess employing professionals in the fitness industry could be a specific coach rather than just a personal trainer, could be a fully qualified yoga teacher to do maybe small group training in your house. But I want to stress, and I'm sure that you probably feel quite similar, is that not everybody on TikTok is a professional with the qualifications. I mean, I know you will post to Instagram, absolutely, and people can get top tips from you. But there is a slight difference between you that have been through all your qualifications, all your years of education, all your practice in there. It's amazing that, as you said, everything's becoming more accessible and people are posting and people are showing what they're doing. Like, keep moving, people. Movement is incredible. But just remember, not everybody has a correct qualification. I, th I think as well, it's that just because it's worked for me or just because it's worked for them doesn't mean it's going to work for you. And I think that's where the personal and the personal yes. training comes in is that we're qualified to adapt stuff to you as a person and that we tailor and make it specific to you and your goals. And I think that's the, you know, yeah, there's basic fundamentals that if you follow, you'll make progress in X, Y, or Z, but what is actually going to work for you is, you know, and it's that trial and error that, Completely. you know, we have as trainers and professionals that deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis that go, okay, we've tried that. That hasn't necessarily worked. Let's try this instead through my knowledge and expertise. I think this is what's going to be best for you. 
but then also you find there's so many examples that it's the complete opposite. Yes. That it's like, like there is so much noise out there, isn't yeah. there? It's like, what is going on? And just, I use yoga as an example. Like a yoga instructor has to do 200 hours of practice and qualifications before they've even got their baseline qualification. And there are a lot of people doing down dogs into child poses, into other yoga breathwork techniques online that haven't necessarily got that correct background. So it's just, just to be aware, go and find the professionals. Okay, next one on, on demand exercise classes. So I love that that is still on there. So this obviously jumped straight to the top of the list during COVID. We were all at home. We all knew we still needed to move. So we were finding on-demand classes or we were streaming classes. And the fact that on-demand exercise classes is still on the list for 2025 means that there is a market for it, means that people are recognizing, even if they can't physically get to the gym or can't get to their tennis lesson or can't meet their mate for badminton, the fact that on-demand exercise classes are still there, I think it's a good thing that the worldwide population is recognizing that movement is important. Yeah, 100% is, um, I think as well, you look back in the, you've got your VHS tapes and you popped it in and then you had your- This right, was before colorful. my time, even though Isaac is giving me the look as if to say, did you used to exercise to a VHS? No, I did not. A CD maybe? A VHS, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I think that that's now developed into the world that we, it's something that has been around for years and years and years, but has developed and changed to fit the current. Absolutely. Um, and what I love about it as well, if I'm working with clients and they're like, oh my God, I'm going away for two weeks, what am I going to do? Uh, open your Everyone Active app and look at Everyone Active On Demand. Like you can literally take trainers that you know, there'll be faces on there that you recognize. Hi, hi. And you can take your phone abroad and still be part of the Everyone Active family and follow your classes on there. So moving on to the next one, which was also obviously very high during COVID, is outdoor fitness activities. Like, amazing. Get out into nature. Do you do chill out walks? Do you do running? Do you do anything outside? Not as much as I used to. So um, I grew up playing rugby. Uh -huh. So that was, that was my initially initial sport background. Mm -hmm. um, and then I got into the powerlifting. But I do try and still go out for waters. I'm very fortunate. Westminster Lodge is right by Verilamian Park, which is a really beautiful, lovely park to go out into. Um, again, vitamin D, not that we get a lot of it in this country, but as much sunlight exposure yeah. as you can. Uh, Absolutely. So, so important. And also, again, going back to us, thousands of, like nature's important to being part of human, getting outside in nature is really important for our psychology and our physiology inside us. And just to be able to take that 20 minute walk in a lunch break or park your car at the end of the car park so you can have that walk to the office. Just being outside gives you a bit of an endorphin rush. You might not feel it at the time, but internally your body is- It make a difference. It's thanking you for it. Okay, this one's sneaking up the list and we kind of mentioned it earlier. Influencer ambassador for led fitness programs. So again, I think we both- put the nod to if you know it's a qualified professional a recognized body like your les mills do online classes everyone active do online classes it's just making sure that you're following somebody that's trained and i mean there's loads of smaller sessions that are being built from it so you might be don't know going couch to 5k was once a tiny tiny little program and now whoa it's huge and that is because there's been ambassadors we know the program works and it's a signed off like the nhs recommends it all fitness professionals are like yeah absolutely so if it's ambassador led and they're qualified brilliant i'm all for it yes yeah 100 <laughs> percent um again it's just as you say there's so many different scopes of fitness now and there's an influence or an ambassador for everything yeah. and uh even my sport is well known but i wouldn't say it's if we walked into the gym and asked everyone do you know what powerlifting is 
I reckon only about 50% of people would maybe give you a correct answer or they go, oh, that's the one where you lift it over your head, right? No, that's weightlifting. <laughs> yeah. So no, that's not going above my head. You know, so I think it is important as well to some of the smaller sports that aren't necessarily as mainstream or up and coming, really getting them out into the, the eyes of the sort of more general public. And um, again, it's one of those things that I didn't know what powerlifting was four years ago. Nice. I've now gone to represent my country at an international competition. So if I didn't know what the sport was, I would have never have done it. I would have never have then got the opportunities that yeah. I got. And, you know, you, you you might be watching this now, not knowing what powerlifting is, and you might be the next world champion, yeah, British are. champion. You not know. if Isaac's competing though, because you know, he'd kind of like <laughs> to win it. Just, just say it. Um, I'm going to do a shout out to actually, she's a member at Westminster Lodge. Lauren. Yes. And if I say Lauren jumps. So what's her sport? Skipping. Yes. So in Lauren's a qualified personal trainer. She's been an ambassador for a lot of recognized sports brands. So she's got the knowledge. And during COVID, she taught herself how to skip. Now, not only has she taught herself how to skip, she has elevated and she's now one of, I'm going to say, the world leaders in the sport of skipping. And she's done it online and she's an ambassador for it. And it's just grown and grown and grown and grown. And I love now how many people are picking back up a skipping rope and going for it. So there's huge positives about bits that you can find online and ambassador led. Like we need to recognize how important that side of social media is. But she was qualified before she even yeah. did it. <laughs> Sorry, got um, a great one that's coming on is, and this is definitely going to have been relevant to you, youth athletic development. So if we go back even 10 years, the majority of scientific studies were all based on 30 to 35 year old men. So obviously we know the adolescent body, male or female, is totally different to a grown adult. Our muscle development is different. Our skeletal development is different. Our growth plates are all totally still forming. And also we're still kind of understanding what we like and what we don't want to do so in terms of youth athletic development there's a big now movement out there to let kids and let sports people do a range of everything like don't just niche you from five years old to pick up a tennis racket because by the time you're 15 years old you've got an elbow injury a shoulder injury and you've totally worn out that so youth athletic development you must have experienced that when you were in rugby. Like, did you have a different training plan to like the men's senior team? Um, yeah, so I was, again, very fortunate. Played at quite a high, high level. Um, played for like county and um, was part of the London Broncos yeah. uh, youth development. Um, and we had strength and conditioning sessions. So okay. from, a, from an early age, I think we were... 15 i think when they first but you know they got us started with wooden dowels you know so we didn't even touch a barbell until the coaches could see us competently do the form and the technique yeah. of a wooden dowel and then it was like okay now you're ready to progress and we didn't just go on and start putting on one rep maxes it was no keep the weight very light um but then also the training for athletic development's a little bit a little bit different um as well but it was a massive, massive part. And I think it built really solid foundations that I still benefit from now, even just right. playing rugby, the cardiovascular fitness, the um, tendon strength, joint strength. Um, you know, I remember being like 12, 13 and we were doing stuff with resistance bands. Perfect. And isometrics and stuff that was helping us at such an early age and at the time you don't realize but now that i'm a little bit older and matured a little bit if you can if, yeah. if, if, if you can if you can say that you you know you look back and you are really kind of grateful for the exposure that you got you're a coach like you were yeah. looked after and that is really gold because now you can power lift because if you'd have lifted really heavy when you were 13 14 there is no way that you'd be able to lift what you lift now because of your ligament damage, because of over-exercise, but hats off to those coaches. And the fact that it's now being even more recognised that youth development is so important in terms of 
prevention of injuries in terms of preservation of sport and also propelling athletes to top of their leagues and top of their games, of which you are one. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, moving up the list, and I love that this is on here, health and wellness coaching. So I think we can say that we are going to go under and through a little bit more rounded knowledge in terms of everyone active, what we can provide to people on the gym floor or just indeed through signing through membership and just having consultations with us. So health and wellness coaching is also our recognition that it's not just about lifting in the gym. I don't know if you even know that you've said it, but just taking your example of you in rugby and you were a high standard for a junior, but your coaches made sure that you did your stretching. So you're in your recovery. I bet they made sure that you were eating correctly. So you've got a bit of your nutrition. I bet they made sure you had rest days. So you had yep. sleep, a little bit of brain di- downtime. I bet they weren't like, it's rugby, 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 rugby. Go and do something else. So it's all that kind of bigger picture of what makes us human. And that's kind of like our health and wellness coaching. So that is great. And it's also hats off to you guys out there. I love that. So these are trends from what people are researching what people are searching on the internet for, for how they're buying and where we're moving in terms of where we're putting our bodies towards. So the fact that that's moving on up is credit to you guys. Like you are superhumans. You need to look after yourselves. So that's great. Okay, next one. Functional fitness training. Ha! Love it. Go on, talk to me about it. I think it's just, again, that, Training is one thing, but then how can you, how does that improve your day-to-day life? Um, You know, great example is suitcase carries is like, yes, it's training your core and it's an exercise in the gym. Right, break it down. What's a suitcase carry? uh, So when you hold a weight on one side of your body in a single arm, trying to keep your core and posture nice and still nice and straight and it's training your uh, obliques side of your core again you think holding a heavy weight in the gym what's the purpose of that Mm -hmm. but when you get asked to bring the shop again and you're able to hold the bag to shop in or again as the name suggests suitcase if you're in an airport or something and you're going on holiday can you lift up that suitcase onto the weighing scales without absolutely Dying or yeah. blowing your or, back out or something. Exactly. It's the injury prevention as well. Like it's basically training our bodies to be able to be human and functionally move and try and prevent injuries. Like there are so many people that go to physios, chiros, you name it, because they've been out in the garden because the sun's come out and they've just gone straight to gardening and not realised that the last time that they actually did any form of hinging, hinging, hip hinging, RDLs was last summer <laughs> when the sun was out. So our functional training is getting our body to move in ways that we're designed to, but we just need to keep our muscle, our muscle memory going. I think I think you used a perfect example earlier of sitting down, standing up out of the chair, squatting. Yeah. So yeah, going into a gym, putting some weights on a barbell, or holding a weight in your hands and doing a goblet squat, whatever version it is, it's simply just sitting down, standing up out of a chair and. it's just like um just yeah it's just great to kind of against when you speak to people and it's they go well what's this doing and then you can give them a real life what or real world practical application of what they're doing and how it's going to benefit them it just switches uh something in their brain and so i was thinking it's also like there is still a little bit of a barrier for people coming into a gym because they don't quite, they're like, oh my gosh, there's some heavy weights and there's kit and there's, but we're just really trying to replicate moves that you will do in day-to-day life and we're just making your body work more efficiently, work better and prevent that injury by introducing some functional training. Okay, exercise for mental health. This also leads into, so we do green prescribing on the NHS. So it's like a recognised function that exercise and hormones that we release from exercising aid and help mental health um 
if you've listened to the Paul Minter podcast that we did a few seasons ago, so he used to serve in the forces, um, was in conflicts, was signed out of the forces with PTSD and his way of managing his PTSD, okay, he went quite extreme because he did an Ironman and then he ran the entire coast of Great Britain. But he's now started a charity that recognises that there are a lot of forces personnel or frontline personnel, including like ambulance staff, fire services, and anybody that's in a bit of a conflict situation, be it face-to-face, -face, be it in a heated environment, that we suffer as humans. Like we're used to people like looking after us and we want to feel that space. And so Paul really recognised that the release of serotonin, which we get when we exercise, really helped his mental state. So that's good that that is recognised, that exercise can help that. I think, again, being a, a little bit younger and mental health being a massive talking point now in Great. in youths, uh, people who are younger, again, with social media and all the side effects that come with that. I think one thing that has really helped myself mm -hmm. growing up has been exercise and sport and just the other things that come with it, just even you know, playing rugby when I was younger, just being around learning how to lose, learning how to um, deal with stress, anxiety, all the different things that come from playing sport, you know, again, being at school, exams, but having those two hours or whatever it is that I was on the rugby pitch, you just don't worry about yeah. everything else and um, it's one thing that we, we talk about ironically in the sport of powerlifting mm -hmm. is when you've got that one rep max on your back your anything could be happening in your life you don't worry about anything else other than going down and coming yeah. back up so for those few seconds it's almost called going into the void nice and that it's even though you're under so much physical stress mentally it's so peaceful because you're in the now you're yeah you're living in the present you're only worrying about that one specific thing that is worrying about you um and then as you say the serotonin that feel good feeling that you get from sitting down standing back up with a heavy weight Completely. there just is nothing yeah it you know, can absolutely greater. ground you like exercise will ground you or let you live in the present so you're not thinking about what's happened you're not anxious about what's ahead of you in the future like you're literally living in the presence and that is absolutely going to help in terms of mental health okay next one up the list data driven training technology so i use a my zone melt occasionally i'm not an avid tech user just because i like to also understand what my body is doing not necessarily with the tech data and um, but i think it's a useful training tool but i would tell people not to get too caught up into it too yeah. caught up into it too obsessed with it don't wake up at two o'clock in the morning going what's my heart rate going next one hit training high intensity interval training i love it it's still part of my workout routine I think it will always be there for as long as that I can do it. Do you do any hit in terms of your cardiovascular training? Yeah, so I try and do it once a week, again, for that general health. Um, you know, you a lot of people, they do low steady state or, you know, they'll go on long runs or long walks, long, but that other aspect of your heart zones, you know, those zone four, zone five yes. that are horrible. <laughs> but very much needed. Um, so again, I think any good training plan, fitness plan should have some form of element. Definitely. To, and it's know. in our, so just bringing it to a UK point of view, it's in our actual NHS guidelines. And we'll probably take that a little bit further, but at least once a week, you should be totally pushing yourself out of your comfort zones. Like it's not just a cardiovascular, it's not just a strength training. We need to at least once a week do a full on out there high zone full on to it and that is here Ooh, traditional strength training look at that making it into the top how are you feeling about that one i'm a bit upset it's not at the top if i'm <laughs> honest but <laughs> <laughs> um yeah obviously by a bit of a bias here but i would very 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 much advocate for this for anyone um not just powerlifting there's other forms of traditional strength training that 
are out there, but I just think it is the number one best thing for you. Yeah, um, it's so important and so good. Like any age, as long as, as we've noted, youth training is differently. We need to make sure that your technique is right before we are bringing in traditional strength training. But if you are an adult that has never done strength training before, come to our gyms. We will talk you through it. We will get you there. And the physical benefits, the mental benefits, even the recovery benefits that you can get from it are phenomenal. Incredible. So, yeah, it's absolutely great that it's there. Exercise for weight loss. So I think that is there because, let's face it, we are in a little bit of a pandemic in terms of obesity rates rising, not only in adults, but unfortunately in children. So that fact that that is now trending and it's number four in the fitness trends for 2025, I think is a great thing. Thoughts? Uh, yeah, I mean, again, it's lo loads of different factors here. Um, again, when you talk about sort of, again, the youth and the kids is, again, with technology, PlayStation, yeah. Xboxes, is it's a great thing that they can socialize, that you can play with your mates that live in the other end of the country or potentially in another country. And again, community brings a lot of people together, but it's very different. Uh, even when I was growing up, it was you went outside and you came back in when it was dark and yeah. it was you spent more time out yes. of the home than inside. Um, again, being out in nature and some of the other things that we've, you know, we've talked about and again, youth athletic development when you were younger and running about climbing up trees and doing yeah. all the, the stuff that, that kids do. And you were fall, functional training whilst you were climbing up those you know, trees. <laughs> fall it, falling over, but you know, it's you, you learn how to fall, you learn how to land properly, you learn how to do all the basic stuff that you kind of take for granted. Yeah. Um, you know, I think now again, potentially look at a typical 13 year old's day is they wake up, they go to school, they sit at a desk for several hours of the day, they go home, they sit in front of a TV totally. for the rest of the time yep. and they go to bed, Yeah, you know. And that um, is not moving, that's not ticking what we very need to do. Very sedentary lifestyle. Um, very. So whilst it's on there, I recognise that it's on there and it's, people have obviously seen that actually need to do something but it would be lovely in a couple of years time if that wasn't a trend because she would managed to slip and people just wanted to improve their strength and improve yeah. their cardio and how we haven't maybe also it's difficult though because we live in a society where food's so over processed and so grabbable and everything's just wanting us to stay still hmm. like i would speak to my dad and he would get off the sofa and change the TV channels on the TV. I would sit there and then have a remote control. And now you can go, hi, I won't say the word in case it sets off everybody's little tech that they've got at home and ask a certain person to change channels for you. Like we're making people sedentary, which is also probably another another factor that we just need to be I think, aware I think of. Like, even with the foods is, it's so easy to go and like, buy a sandwich now. You don't even have to get the loaf of bread out of the packet, yes. get the butter out, get the filling out and actually make it yourself. You yep. can just buy it pre, buy it pre-made. So it's just all of these small things that have been made to make our lives more convenient have also had some sort of negative impact along. Yeah, along totally. Um, so oh. it's again, trying to find that balance of Get moving, team. You can do this. You can do this. Okay, top three. So in third is fitness programs for older adults. In two are mobile exercise apps. And number one is wearable technology. Fitness programs for older adults. We have ages just a number campaign. I bloom in love that that's now third. How incredible is that we've got, we do know that we've got an aging population, but people are recognizing how important movement is, how important fitness is. And like functional training, strength training, aqua training, low impact training. There is so much that is still on offer to you, regardless of your age. Age is just a number. Age is just a number. <laughs> Moving on to mobile exercise apps. So again, we've got everyone active on demand, but mobile exercise apps, I guess, are your trackers. 
So you could set and you're going to say whether you're doing a run or whether you're doing strength training and then how that technology is letting you know what the body is doing, which also links into wearable tech. Have you seen out there that you can now literally sleep and track your heart rate? You've got little rings that will let you know how your Apple watches and you name it. Glucose monitors, glucose patches. Yeah, there is so much technology out there. But on the old wearable tech, I would just say again, just remember we are human and our machines are incredibly within us, like our physiology. We can like look after all forms of that being human, our wellness. And absolutely, the tech plays its part. But don't forget how important. I think, I think yeah, it uh, can be really good, useful tools, but don't take it for gospel. You know, I think... It's that thing of, you know, with sleep, for example, you know if you've had a good night's sleep or not because you either wake up feeling refreshed or you don't. Yes. You know, I don't I don't need a watch to tell me how well or how good or bad my sleep is. But if, and again, it all, all depends on your kind of goals and, you know, if you are someone who is looking to push yourself to that finite limit, stuff like that where, you know, if it gives yeah. you that added one or two percent yes. compared to someone else, then you're going to see the difference. But, you know, from a day-to-day -day kind of standpoint, it's, you know, you don't need it to tell you if you've had a good night's sleep, sleep yeah. or not. And Especially when someone's going to turn around and be like, uh, were you on your phone half an hour before you tried to go to sleep? Have you drunk enough water today? Oh, you know what? That might just be affecting your sleep. But you are spot on with that. If you want that extra 1%, if you're an elite athlete, if you're up there with your sports and you need that 1%, there is an absolute place for it. But day to day, yeah. completely think about what your body is feeling and you are spot on with the sleep. If you wake up refreshed, probably have a good, good sleep. sleep. Right, on that note, my lovely, thank you so, so much for coming on the podcast. It's all right, I had great fun. Yay, it's been lovely to have you. Team, as always, if you've got any questions or you want to do a little bit of research on the top 20 trends, please do so. Leave any comments on whatever platform you are viewing this on if you are listening please rate us please share us and you know what let isaac know how amazing he is and good luck with your new phase of training Thank and development and remember team you can always email us at podcast at everyoneactive.com thank you so much for coming on thanks for having me my pleasure and team we will see you soon take care